Hello, my name is Dan, and uh, I am the chief engineer at Kruger. I started at Kruger in 1981, I believe, so I've been doing this for some time. Um, we're going to talk about uh, perimeter today. Um, put up some of my credentials here so that you can see who I am. Um, we talked in a webinar last year about selecting and placing diffusers, concentrating mostly on uh, the interior zone. And uh, today we're going to talk about the perimeter. And there are some differences between the perimeter and the interior. So we kind of need to first understand what are we talking about here? We got uh, perimeter zones and interior zones, and they're handled quite differently for a number of reasons. Uh, the perimeter zone is typically a space that's located uh, near a window, and uh, the interior zone is a space that's by some definitions 15 feet from the perimeter surface. In open plan offices where you've got uh, no wall between the two, uh, 15 feet is kind of a magic number. Um, there actually, of course, is no dividing line. Um, most offices that uh, are at the perimeter are no more than 15 feet deep, so it still kind of works. So uh, the perimeter zone is, is an interesting place in that we have the occupant load, we have equipment load, which we also have in the interior. But in addition, we have uh, a radiant sun load coming in. Um, we have a, uh, we have a uh, cooling load, uh, a heating demand load, cold, it may be cold outside, the window may be cold, surfaces get cold. So cold or hot surfaces create convection currents along them. So if the window is hot, window air tends to rise up. If the window is cold, air tends to fall down along the window. Um, and then we got to deal with the sun shining in and heating surfaces inside the space. So a big difference between in the perimeter between heating and cooling is that heating typically only happens at the window, but cooling is required some distance in. And again, that depends on how tall the window is. So we got to deal with all those different issues. Interior zones, uh, which are typically more than 15 feet, are independent of outside temperatures and humidities, uh, pretty much. Uh, the ventilation air is not, but the space itself is pretty much isolated from what's going on outside. We have mandated minimum ventilation rates, um, and humidity control is required in the interior zone as well. Both of those often require cold air, and with the low loads we're seeing in offices today, we are finding cases where maintaining humidity and ventilation rates, the space becomes subcooled, and we spent some time talking about that in the last talk. Um, but there are, uh, uh, we need to pay attention to that. If we can take some of the warm plenum air and mix it into the interior zone, um, we can actually help some of that, uh, offset some of that uh, subcooling that would happen otherwise. Another thing is different about the interior zone. The interior zone is typically characterized by multiple diffusers in repeated configurations that lead themselves to the use of the Air Diffusion Performance Index, or ADPI. The Air Diffusion Performance Index can be measured, complicated, in a laboratory, but we can use it to predict air motion in a space and the uniformity of temperatures within a space. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about that in the, uh, in the last session. Um, but these spaces that are between eight and 10 foot ceiling, suspended ceiling with the fuses located in the ceiling is ideal for an ADPI analysis. Um, if the ceiling is outside of uh, eight to 10 feet, however, we have to do some kind of jet mapping because the ADPI calculations assume a certain ceiling height. And, uh, um, and jet mapping is also required in other places where we may have collisions with beams and soffits and whatnot. So perimeter zones, um, are uh, a lot, the loads are a lot less in perimeter zones than they used to be, but the, because uh, we got better glass, um, but the cold surface uh, generates a downward convective flow and may cause cold radiant effects and temperatures for the occupants. Now, there's some debate about the radiant effect. Um, um, one of the things that happens when we talk about heating from the ceiling, the ceiling gets warm, it offsets the cold window. The mean radiant may be neutral, in a lot of perimeter zones, but nonetheless, there is an issue with a cold surface and cold drafts falling down the window. Uh, and on the other hand, when the sun is shining, uh, if the glass is tinted, the glass may get hot. If there's shading 
inside the window, yeah, the shades may get hot as the sun shines on it. In either case, hot air rises. Um, we have talked in the past about recommending a return slot to the return air plenum, if there is a return air plenum, above the window. They've been doing that in Houston for some time. Um, it's a pretty good way of taking heat away from the space without the HVAC system having to handle it in the space. So that's one of the things we do. Um, there are regulations, 62.1, the ventilation standard, talks about trying to avoid uh, ventilation short circuiting that results from putting hot air out at the ceiling, which hot air rises, the room may stratify. There are limitations there, we'll talk about those. 90.1 says you can't heat air that's been previously cooled, that makes kind of sense. And uh, that limits some airflow requirements and um, causes some design standards that people use. Standard 55, the thermal comfort standard, uh, limits the occupied zone, which is from the floor to six feet, um, to have 5.4 degrees vertical temperature stratification um, for comfort. So all three of those uh, constraints uh, constrain what we want to do in a perimeter zone. Because of the asymmetrical nature of air distribution, you need to have it closer to the window, not in the center of the space. It causes a problem trying to do ADPI in a perimeter zone. ADPI assumes uniform air distribution in all directions from a diffuser. It's difficult to make ADPI work in an asymmetric diffuser location. <coughs> and while there is some interesting data coming and looking at, we might be able to do ADPI for heating, uh, they haven't worked out all the details yet. So there is some research that's promising, but for now, uh, you're not gonna use ADPI in a perimeter zone. Um, so what you got to do is jet mapping. Uh, in this example, air moves across the ceiling, comes down the windows. Uh, in this case, it's a cooling example, and it will then be warmed and it will circulate into the space. Um, we can look at the throw data that's in the catalogs to figure where the jet is going to go, and we'll talk more about some things we can do with that. Uh, the problem we have is that we need to both heat and cool this space, and we find that there are things happen heating and cooling that uh, had to be considered in our selection of devices. So when there is a large change in air temperature discharge from a diffuser, there's a big change in the way the jet moves in the space. Again, remember, hot air rises, cold air falls. Cold air is heavier, it's going to come down. So if you're looking at a projection of air from a diffuser, if you size the, the, the uh, airflow outlet and the airflow to get the heat to come down, it's got to make it down at least four feet, partly to meet code and cycle because that's what you got to do if you want to heat a space that, that has a heating demand. Um, when you put cold air at the same flow rate, it's going to go a lot further, and we'll show you the calculations on that in a second. Um, if you're dealing with cold air jet, uh, and you try to keep the cold air from going into the occupied zone, hitting the floor and coming across, if you use the same airflow for heat, it may not make it down far enough to provide comfort in the space. So we have to take a look at uh, both heating and cooling performance of the diffuser and decide what to do. So heating is uh, typically done these days from the ceiling. Almost all new construction does from the ceiling. As hot air rises, most modern systems heat from the ceiling, uh, and that's what's done in almost probably 90% of all cases in which there is not a radiator under the window, they're heating from the ceiling. And when you do that, hot air rising, avoiding stratification is a challenge. The uh, uh, good news is you only really have to manage heating demand right close to the exterior wall. And uh, there's a cold sheet of air moving down a window when it's cold outside, and you need to temper it when it falls into the space. That's the deal. Avoiding room stratification is a challenge, especially with gas-fired rooftops, which may have discharge temperatures in the 120, 130 degree range. Um, and if you deliver that directly into the room, the room is gonna stratify. Um, the good news is, if it's 130 or 140 degrees, it won't do it very long. There'll be a short period of time in which the fan has to run, according to code, and the room gets mixed up. Um, but while you're delivering that hot air, the room is gonna stratify. And this is, this is a challenge. Uh, we're seeing proportional gas valves on uh, gas-fired rooftops, which allow you to go to lower flows and whatnot. 
with a hot water coil, like on a VAV reheat box or a, a fan coil, um, we can have infinite control of discharge temperatures much better. Uh, electric heat with its stages, a lot of times we'll find the first stage is not enough and the second stage is too much. Uh, and the result is the room gets stratified. And once the room with multiple stage electric heat is stratified, it's very difficult to unstratify it. Uh, we've actually recommended people disconnect the second and third stages of heat when rooms are terribly stratified. So looking at heating systems, there are a number of strategies that we can do for heating. Many systems utilize single duct VAV with a reheat coil and perimeter zones. In fact, that's probably the most popular way of doing perimeter zones in North America, is single duct uh, VAV with a reheat coil. It works really well in temperate climates. There are issues in really cold climates with getting, uh, avoiding stratification and at the same time handling the demand for heat from an overhead system. Fan power terminals work better in cold climates uh, because you can control the airflow independent of whether or not the compressors are running, we'll talk about that in a second. Fan powered boxes, uh, fan powered boxes, there's two kinds that we see. We see the series box and we see the parallel box. When we see a series box, that's where the fan is on the discharge. Those are typically used throughout the space. Houston and Seattle are both series fan box towns. Parallel boxes, however, uh, we see parallel box where the fan only runs when you need heat at the perimeter with single duct boxes in the interior. That is the style in both Portland, which has the same climate as Seattle, and Dallas, which uh, is similar to Houston in climate, although not quite as severe. But apparently it's not a climate deal. Apparently it's a style thing about whether you're gonna use series or parallel boxes. Uh, we're seeing more people using series boxes and less people using parallel boxes for a number of reasons. Uh, we are also seeing in cold climates baseboard perimeter heat still being used with single duct cooling uh, and ventilation. Um, that's because typically uh, these spaces, uh, Wisconsin is an example, which is primarily baseboard perimeter heat. Although uh, in places like Montana, we're seeing the single duct reheat box. So there's climate doesn't necessarily tell the story. Uh, this is what we're seeing. Cooling is an interesting issue. Uh, you heat at the glass, but cooling you've got to cool as far in as the sunlight will penetrate, which in the fall and the spring, when the sun is lower and it's still warm out, can be quite a ways into the perimeter zone. So as cold air falls, um, it, it's gonna make it to the floor. We don't have to worry about cold air short circuiting and there's no requirement in 62.1 to pay attention to that issue. Um, and the Delta T is not an issue in cooling, it's gonna come down, um, but because um, we need to deal with solar going further in. Uh, we may get uh, upward air currents along the surface of the window and heat generated by furniture located in the uh, interior zone because solar radiation may extend some distance into the perimeter. The trick is how do you cool a wide area and only heat a short area? Well, we're going to talk about that as well. So we've got to manage both these to control skin load and perimeter zone. Because cold air will travel down, we have to be careful not to have cold air enter the occupied zone at the floor. And we're typically directing hot air down. When we go to cold air, ideally we should throttle back, but it turns out because it's gonna go further, but that's often not convenient. So we have to think about strategies to try to make that work. Um, and uh, one of the strategies we'll talk about here in a minute. So. In looking at perimeter systems, we have to look at a number of different solutions. Uh, slot diffusers are the most common solution at the perimeter. Um, linear slot diffusers work best because they direct all the air where you need it, either at the window or into the adjacent uh, perimeter zone. Um, slots direct air in a sheet, typically along a surface. Um, this uh, has a number of advantages from avoiding uh, inadvertent drop from the cold air along the ceiling. Um, but nonetheless, the problem with slot diffusers is they have to be adjusted. Uh, all but one of the slot diffusers we sell is adjustable. The question comes up, whose job is it to adjust the pattern controller in a linear slot diffuser? And the answer is not the balancer. Even though it does say in some uh, requirements that the balancer should adjust slot diffusers, 
typically they won't. And there's a number of reasons why they won't. One, because they don't know how, where, how it's supposed to go. Um, and secondly, because they typically don't have the time in their budget to adjust these pattern controllers. We walk into spaces and look up, we see a lot of improperly adjusted pattern controllers at the perimeter. Ideally, the slot next to the window should be set to blow air towards the window. The slot away from the window should be set to blow air into the room. If the diffuser is located a couple of feet away and oh, a feet away and there's a soffit, we can spill some of the pattern from the window side slot so that it goes under the, the soffit. Uh, that was a question that came up earlier. Um, but adjusting that pattern control is critical to making these things work. If all the slots are set to blow down, I can guarantee you the room is going to stratify, and that's not a good thing. Um, the X-ray handbook says the linear slot should be located two feet from and parallel to the exterior wall blowing both ways. In some cases, we see multiple slots blowing into the room and only one blowing down. In other colder climates, I've seen multiple slots blowing towards the window or down at the window and another slot blowing into the room. Again, climate will determine a lot about where that happens. Often we see square four-way blow diffusers. Uh, in this example, you can see they're located offset close to the wall. This is required if you want to get the heating airflow to get down into the occupied zone enough to offset the cold wear spilling down the window. One of the things that happens when you do this, of course, is you may get some collisions at the midpoint between diffusers. Um, it's difficult to control these. It may be ideal to not have anyone sit at the midpoint between diffusers. In my recommendation, uh, when I talk about perimeter zones, I always recommend that the uh, uh, perimeter zone be a corridor so that people don't have to sit next to the window. Uh, closed offices with a single outlet, again, the diffuser tends to be offset towards the window, um, and uh, it's easier to control these things. You don't have jet collisions and whatnot in a closed office. So, um, Outlets should often be offset towards the perimeter, as we say in this slide. Um, buoyancy can be predicted with a, a some degree of accuracy. We, we know that we can estimate the effect of temperature on throw using a simple equation. Remembering that hot air falls, uh, hot air rises and cold air falls. A simple rule is take the 75 foot per minute throw. Okay, where do you get 75 foot per minute throw? The catalogs print 50 and 100 foot per minute throw. 75 foot per minute will be in between the two. So. Figure out your 75 foot a minute throw, and almost every diffuser in the Kruger catalog, the throw data is isothermal, which means room temperature. Uh, of course, no matter what the temperature is in the room, it's room temperature, that's a joke. Uh, this is 75 feet, 1% per degree delta T. So let's look at an example. Let's say I have a jet of air, which in the catalog says it has, say, 10 foot throw down, and I have 20 degrees cooling, how much further is it going to go? It's going to go 20% further or two feet further, 20% further to 75 feet a minute. That same jet, if I go to 20 degrees heating, is going to go 20% shorter or only eight feet. So what that shows, though, is that if I go from 20 degrees cooling to 20 degrees heating, there's a 40% change in throw. And that's a big deal because you have to size the diffuser and the airflow, so the heating airflow will make it down to within four feet of the floor. And when you do that, the cooling airflow is going to enter the occupied zone because it's going to go 40% further. So this is one of the things we got to consider. Along a ceiling, remember we're talking about buoyancy here, hot air is going to go further by the same rule, 1% uh, per degree delta T at 75 feet a minute. So we can do these, use these calculations to figure out What's going on due to buoyancy? Sometimes we see grills in the perimeter. Uh, in this example shown here, the grill is in the soffit blowing away from the window. Probably not ideal. Um, more often we'll see uh, a grill located in a soffit opposite the window, blowing towards the window. We'd like that a little better. Um, but again, trying to calculate the performance of a grill is complicated because the blades on the front can be adjusted, or as in the photo, you can see above the blades on the front are randomly adjusted as in that photo, which is by the way, 
which is most often the circumstance that you'll see in the real world. We actually ran some tests for the Trump Towers in Chicago uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, with wall facing grills and the question was raised, is this gonna work? And I asked what the Delta T was gonna be and they said they were gonna have 25, 20 to 25 degrees Delta T. And we ran a test and that doesn't work. They had to redesign the coils to deliver air only 15 degrees above the room temperature, which by the way is less than 90 degrees in the 73 degree room to avoid stratification. Um, we ran those tests real time for the engineers in Chicago when they were doing the design. A jet in which there is no ceiling effect, typically from a grill or a drum louver or a nozzle, um, the 1% rule works, but it works a little differently when it's a free jet. Uh, horizontal jet buoyancy, the 75 foot per minute throw is not changed, but the jet will rise or fall by 1% per degree delta T. Um, and that gives you an idea of how much it goes up and down. The good news about these uh, sidewall grills is typically you can adjust the jet up or down, um, <coughs> but typically you can't do it by season. <clears throat> so you try to find a setting that'll work under all conditions because people aren't going to go up there and adjust it on the fly. Uh, displacement diffusers uh, have been used at the perimeter. Now there are some issues with displacement. Displacement is where we deliver air at 60 degrees or so at low velocity near the floor. Uh, these examples here, these three um, diffusers are located near a perimeter and if they were spilling 60 to 65 degree air across the floor, um, it would uh, <clears throat> provide cooling uh, across that space to take care of the sun load that was shining in. Uh, the bad news is they really don't do well in heating. Um, you can get these with a changeover element to create a window jet in heating, uh, but those cost a lot of money and require dual ducts. Maybe it's a little complicated. Um, typically though, displacement diffusers should be used for cooling um, at the perimeter. They work real well, especially when you have really tall glass in the window. Uh, by the way, you probably shouldn't sit next to a displacement diffuser. Uh, the question was raised, what is the near zone near one of these diffusers? I like to say that as a rule of thumb, uh, four feet at 250 CFM is a good rule where you shouldn't sit next to a displacement diffuser. Uh, it's gonna, it won't be uncomfortable at first, but eventually you get coal soaked and it becomes uncomfortable if you sit there. Uh, in this kind of an, uh, as shown in the photo, this is not an issue because people aren't gonna be spending any time there. Chilled beams have been used in the perimeter. They're best used in a temperate climate. Um, because a chilled beam is an induction device, uh, the, delta, the discharge temperature will not be as cold or as hot as the supply air or the coils that are, are producing heating or cooling. Um, as a result, there is some limitations to how much perimeter uh, load they can actually handle. Uh, in a non-temperate climate, you might want to consider baseboard or some other solutions in a perimeter zone with chilled beams. Um, again, there's some limitation due to the reduced delta T that's inherent in a chilled beam design. <clears throat> radiant panels have often been located above a window. Uh, I'm not a fan of radiant panels. If you're seated at a desk next to a radiant panel, your feet are in the shadow and it gets cold at the floor. Secondly, radiant panels tend to heat the environment next to the, uh, uh, that, are, that are exposed to the radiant panels like desks and furniture, which then heats the air and the result is the room becomes stratified. Um, again, I would recommend radiant panels only in a corridor, not where people are spending a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> what we have found, by the way, is that with radiant heating, with uh, all air heating from the ceiling, the ceiling tiles warm up and the ceiling becomes a large radiant surface, which tends to offset the radiant effect of a cold window. In fact, the tests that we ran, we found neutral radiant once we got with uh, more than two feet away from the window or in the comfort zone because the warm ceiling offsets the cold windows. We need to look at some special applications. High ceilings, uh, atrias, areas with tall glass walls. Um, the good news is typically these are not where people spend a lot of time. Uh, nonetheless, we have to deal with uh, that entire surface radiating uh, and creating a cold draft down the window. 
Um, the good news is that cold air delivered, even 20, 30 feet up, will make it to the floor. Um, but you've got to deliver it as far as the solar load penetrates. And as shown in this example, if this was a west exposure, the sun could shine in 30, 40 feet. But heating only needs to be supplied at the glass. Um, but usually at a greater volume to overcome the negative buoyancy of the air. So how do we deal with this circumstance? Well, in the past, what we found is if you put a single duct VAV box on the diffuser supplying the interior zone side of the perimeter zone and shut it off in heating, that increases the airflow to the diffusers located at the glass, which makes them go further in heating. This is a very simple, low cost solution and has been utilized. So closing off interior zone diffusers in heating mode is a pretty good strategy when you have a high ceiling. <clears throat> Corridors are an interesting problem. Corridors may have <clears throat> exposed skin on both sides, um, but the good news about corridors is they're outside the thermal comfort zone, so you don't have to worry about drafts, which are likely because the loads in here may require airflow that it's, uh, that's gonna create some drafts, which are seldom objectionable to people who are moving, and typically if it's a corridor, you hope people are moving and not remaining sedentary. Openable windows is an interesting discussion, and some climates uh, encourage open windows. Obviously, California, <clears throat> some other places uh, where they can open windows a large portion of the time. Problem is, of course, there's a conflict between an HVAC system and an open window. Uh, one's trying to dehumidify, the other is not. And uh, we've seen uh, s codes that require micro switches that when the windows open, it turns off the HVAC in the zone. What we found in these cases is, at least in some cases, that the occupants prefer the quiet of the window closed and the comfort of the HVAC rather than breeze and the open window. Um, <clears throat> the good news about having micro switches on the windows is you can track when the windows are open and uh, we find the windows aren't open as much as people might like to think. The real problem with an open window, if you have non-condensing or sensible cooling coils, Humidity uh, control is lost when you open the window. I would never recommend putting a device with a sensible cooling coil, no matter what it is, in a dormitory where students live with openable windows. Because guess what? They're gonna open the window, and that's the only place that we've ever seen condensation issues with chilled beams is in dormitories. So going back to our spaces, the open office, uh, many, most uh, office spaces today have open plan offices. Partitions divide the workplace, provide some acoustical privacy. They also provide some interesting air distribution features. But we have multiple diffusers, typically in an open plan office, in repeated patterns. And we can use ADPI if the ceiling is between 8 and 10 feet to figure out what's going on. We need to look at collisions of jets if you have higher ceilings or lower ceilings, um, and especially if you don't have a ceiling, which we'll talk about as well. A closed office typically only has one diffuser. Uh, and because the excess air will wash the walls, we don't worry about jet collisions in, in a closed office. But what we do need to be concerned about is what happens when that system is at low lows, which oftentimes in a closed perimeter office, the interior heat gain equals the exterior heat loss. The diffuser will be at minimum. We need to figure out, is this diffuser going to, and I'm going to use the term, create excessive uh, downdrafts or excessive drop. Uh, the vernacular is, does the diffuser dump? One way to find out if a diffuser is likely to do that is to look in the new Kruger Quick Select catalog where we list what the minimum effective CFM per square foot is of a number of different types of diffusers. Um, you should probably not put a diffuser that's going to have poor performance at low flow over someone's desk, um, which is where they are almost always located. Um, Typically, we see square, four-way pattern diffusers in closed offices, uh, and they work well there. If you have no ceiling, a lot of the rules change. Diffuser performance in the catalog is almost always specified to be along a surface. Um, this is because that's the way they're mostly used, but it has a strong effect on throw. If there is no adjacent surface to a diffuser and throw data assumes there is, the throw, actual throw will be about 30% shorter than what's in the catalog. 
um, because it induces air faster and the jet slows down faster. Um, secondly, cold air may fall into the space from a diffuser. The good news is when there's no ceiling, typically the diffusers are higher and there's more chance for the air to diffuse and less likelihood of a objectionable draft under a diffuser. Um, but understand that you cannot use catalog performance for most diffusers if there is no ceiling. Typically what we see in a open plan, no ceiling office is round diffusers on spiral drops. Um, these work really well. One of the reasons being that the round diffuser has a slightly upward pattern, which tends to offset the drop that might happen otherwise. And the larger the drop, the less likely there is to be non-uniform discharge from the diffuser. If you have a small diameter duct coming down to a round diffuser, the air may remain piled up on one side and you may get asymmetrical airflow out of that diffuser. So we like to see a large drop coming down with a round diffuser on the bottom of it. Um, it tends to work really well. And uh, we've got a lot of jobs that are working just fine doing that. Um, if there is no suspended ceiling, I strongly recommend baseboard heat uh, under the, uh, because you really can't control the airflow down the window very well, because you're gonna have a lot more glass if there's no suspended ceiling. When there's a closed ceiling, again, the throw data from the catalog works because it almost always assumes the surface and it will keep the cold air from falling into the space. We can use ADPI if the ceiling is around nine foot high. Again, everywhere except in the perimeter. If ceiling heights are greater than 10, we got to use jet collision. But again, at the perimeter, ADPI doesn't work because the diffuser doesn't have symmetrical airflow. It's going to be offset, and we got to primarily use air jets to figure out what's going on. We do have to deal with the rules. There are rules in this knife fight. Um, 62.1 says if you put warm air out at the ceiling, some of the ventilation air is going to pass out the ceiling and return, short circuiting, and if the delta T distance discharge to room differential exceeds 15 degrees, it's strongly recommended <laughs> that you increase the ventilation rate by dividing the required minimum ventilation by 0.8. That results in a little over 20% increase in ventilation if the delta T exceeds 15 degrees. By the way, if the room is 73, which is kind of the ideal winter setting, that means the discharge temperature needs to be 87 degrees. Um, think about that, that causes some interesting problems. Um, in addition, you wanna get the 150 foot a minute throw, that's the short throw in the catalog, to make it to within four and a half feet of the floor. Now, these are both requirements in the ventilation rate procedure of standard 62.1, which is code in almost every municipality that I've been in. Uh, I think it's probably code everywhere in North America. New York was one of the last to do it, but I think everybody is now on board. So this is a code requirement, which a lot of people are not really aware of. Um, 90.1, which is code everywhere, also limits the amount of air that you can reheat if the system is being mechanically cooled. That means when the chillers are running, you really have a limitation, it's 30% of the cooling airflow is the maximum amount you're allowed to reheat when the compressors are running. Now, it's been pointed out to me that if it's cold outside, you shouldn't be running the compressors. You should bring in cold air in and using it directly as an economizer. Uh, you shouldn't need to run the heat, although that's not always true. Uh, this is the rule. There is an addenda to 90.1 that says, if you control the discharge temperature and use variable volume heating, with a VAV reheat box, you can start at 20% and go to 50% as long as you control the discharge to room temperature differential. Um, the result of all this is that VAV reheat, the most common system, we often see them with very high discharge temperatures. Um, and the result is that we find a lot of spaces are uncomfortable as a result. Okay, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Um, we have some interesting resources available to you. The catalog, uh, the big catalog and the quick reference product catalog are both available online and through the Kruger Rep. Uh, the quick reference product catalog has, which was out last year, um, actually a year and a half ago now, 
um, has in it some guidelines on open plan office diffuser separation, which won't help you much at the perimeter, but it does tell you something about the minimum airflow through a diffuser and which is likely to have excessive drop. The website has a number of white papers, uh, several computer programs, several Excel spreadsheets for acoustics. Um, uh, the, the Kruger K-Select program will allow you to do uh, throws at uh, a number of different conditions and different sizes of diffusers that may not be in the catalog. So there's a lot of stuff on the website that's available. We have dynamic uh, grill selection catalog pages where the catalog page is built based on your requirements for size, so you can pick any size grill. All that's on the website. And then finally, the software, uh, K-Select and uh, other software that's on the website will let you do a lot of these calculations uh, very well and, and accurately so you can figure out what's going on. So we need to know what's happening at the perimeter so we can design an air distribution system that works both in heating and cooling. Um, we got to pay attention to hot air rising and what happens to the throw when you put when you go from heating to cooling with a given air outlet. Uh, the number of products and system solutions, the uh, single duct VAV reheat box at the perimeter, which has been kind of the standard, is being supplanted now by series fan boxes throughout the zone. Um, the chilled box, which we didn't talk about in this talk, but which I'm very fond of, um, and parallel fan boxes as well at the perimeter um, provide better solutions than a single duct reheat. Um, we have to look at the space. It, does it have a ceiling? Is there a soffit at the perimeter? Uh, we didn't talk about uh, grills in the floor at the perimeter, which somebody brought up in the last session. Um, we can blow warm air up at the perimeter. Um, and again, we have a number of floor diffusers that are set aside for that, including some for the underfloor. So there's a number of those considerations to do. And finally, we have to deal with building codes and ASHRAE standards. 90.1, 62.1, and 55 are the biggies. And of course, 170 if you're in a hospital zone. So pay attention to the codes and standards. And we got a bunch of good tools. Look up the tools, you'll see them out there. So this is me, and I'm gonna turn this over to Lily, and we'll see what we have in the way of questions.